to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Glad you're here today. Glad you're able to join with us. For those of us, or those of you who are joining us uh, uh, with uh, the Armstrong Neighborhood Channel, we're glad that you're tuning in as well. We never underestimate uh, uh, what it's like to be able to, to uh, spend a little bit of time with you in your home. So glad you're joining us in this broadcast as well. Uh, just a reminder to you, when you're coming, uh, coming for the 11 o'clock service on Sunday mornings, somewhere around 10.30 or a little bit after it, uh, the, uh, on 99.1, uh, we're starting to, where organ music is being played, so you could listen to organ music on your way in here uh, at, at 11 o'clock, or before 11 o'clock, so just so you know that. And uh, for those of uh, you who are out in the parking lot listening to on the, on the radio, we're glad that you're with us here as well today. This is just a couple of announcements here, maybe before we, before we start. Let me do it that way. Uh, we've got a beautiful thank you note from uh, Love, Inc. and uh, Yolanda uh, Vargason, who had also uh, headed, up the, uh, headed up the backpack program from Love, Inc. And uh, there are 40, 40 students that are being cared for by some of the things that you provided during this last month. And so a beautiful thank you comes to us from Love, Inc. And I want you to know that and, and be, uh, be very much aware of that. The other thing that... Uh, I want to make sure that I do not neglect here this morning. Oh, just a reminder that Staff Parish is meeting this Tuesday night at 6, and also uh, uh, trustees will be meeting at 7 o'clock on Tuesday night. I believe that we're hoping to uh, try to work with uh, the virtual choir again. And uh, are, we, are we inviting people to come next Sunday right at the moment? We may need other times depending on how it goes, right? But uh, Sean, our choir director, is going to work with us again, and we're going to try something differently where the virtual choir will all come at the same time, but only we're recording each section at a time. Uh, we took one stab at it. That's not very easy to do, but it's worthwhile, and we're still trying to learn how to do that. So if there's any chance that those of you who sing with the choir, uh, there won't be a lot of time to rehearse, so you really will have to be able to, to, to remember the music as well as we can. But uh, we'll be meeting after this, the 8.30 service is over at 9.30. We'll be gathering together in order to do that. And it'll take two-thirds of us being quiet while the other third is, is uh, taping their particular section. So um, we'll try to get the word out for people who aren't here today to not know about it. But next Sunday, we're going to do that between the two services uh, starting around 9.30. I believe those are the announcements that we needed to make here this morning. Again, we are very glad that you're able to be with us. We are recognizing our veterans today. We had seven of them with us in the early service. Um, and uh, maybe before we, before we even start anything further, I'd just show, uh, show of hands if you're one of our veterans here so that I can know who's here. Excellent. Um, then what I think we'll do today, we have the opportunity um, uh, to have Bill Greenlee with us and, and, and of course, um, certainly a veteran of, of, of the U.S. Navy, and uh, he is going to be presenting the colors, and I invite you to stand while the flag is brought up. Would you do so? You may be seated. There is a call. Some hear it like a distant thunder. Some hear it like a whisper in the ear. Some just feel it in their hearts. 
a deep sense of responsibility to country, to service, to something bigger than themselves. We honor those who are willing to do what so few have done. Because of their sacrifice and service, our country is a light on the hill that cannot be put out. Though many have tried, those who stand and protect it are heroes, worthy of our respect and admiration, worthy of every minute of attention we give to pause and recognize the hope, the sacrifice, the honor of all who have served our country. I appreciate so much the privilege of uh, recognizing those of you who have served in, uh, in the armed forces. John, I know that you are one of them. And John, I'm going to need your help today. I'm going to ask if you come forward. Would you, John Pauly? John, can I ask you where, uh, who you served with? United States Army. United States Army. Was a fire direction control specialist. Yeah. Here's what I want, John. You see the envelope right there? I didn't even warn John of this, by the way, but there are coins in there for each one of our veterans. There are, are little plastic packs with three in each pack. Um, if you would open that up, and, and as as we uh, as we greet, have greet, we're going to let you do the walking instead of them coming forward today is what we're doing. So if you'd be willing to hand that as as we would stand, and I just wonder if those of you veterans, uh, if able, if you'd be willing to stand or raise your hand so that we can see again where you are. Would you please stand? Thanking each of you for your service. While he's passing those out, um, we already, uh, any others in, served in the Navy? I know we had Bill here served in the Navy. Yes, three of you gentlemen. Um, by the way, we had, two, uh, we had a couple of ladies with us in the early service as well. Um, and uh, we also had a Coast Guard. Anyone from the Coast Guard? We had one here from the Coast Guard in the early service. We had about seven veterans in the early service. Very good. Anyone, uh, any, uh, those in the Army? Bob already raised his hand. Is another? All right. Um, we've got Navy, we've got Army. It's time for Air Force. Yep. Bill, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for your service. Um, Marine? Back here, John. We had one. Oh, we were out. We did, um, there are three in each one of those packets. We, uh, if one of you, if some of you have three coins in there, we need to share those if we can. Each one of those plastic packets had three in them. I didn't say that very clearly. That's my fault. I think there's a scripture for that. He giveth and he taketh away. I think that's what. The, and I'm sure that's <laughs> sure that's not the way God wanted me to do that, but. Uh, <laughs> the worst thing was that I did that to John. John, I'm so sorry about that. You're very kind. One more time, if we could just say thank you to those, uh, uh, the men and women who have served. Can we do that? We'll be able to straighten those out and those mistakes that I made on there. Sorry about that. You may be seated, folks. This is a time in our worship service in which we just want to prepare our hearts and mind. And uh, will, you just, uh, will you just sign it yourselves while how the organ begins to lead us?
be seated. For those of you at home who could not hear me during the call to worship, it might have to do with the fact that I didn't have my mic on, and I apologize. Uh, don't blame that on the sound people, if you can. Well, I'm going to ask Margaret if she would come at this time. This is Margaret Alsdorf. Do you know any Alsdorfs, folks? This is Jerome's mom, and uh, Mar uh, Margaret... Uh, uh, it has, is willing to serve for Jesus these days. Well, she had hoped to hang out to, with Jerome, and Jerome was supposed to accompany her a little bit in the early service, and he bailed out on us, Margaret. Um, he was under the weather and was unable to be here today. But uh, Margaret comes to us, uh, no stranger to kingdom ministry, and um, she has, uh, has blessed me when she's been willing to play, and so will you just make her feel welcome? Good morning. It's beautiful out today. Amazing grace, how sweet. Yeah, I've heard. 
Find your voice. I was telling, telling uh, Margaret that if she has any stories about Jerome we can use against him, uh, we pay money for that. And, uh, uh, and she was ready to share, so that's pretty good. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. We do appreciate that. Do I uh, wonder if we could just invite you to stand for the doxology. Would you please stand? Father in heaven, we give you thanks, and once again, you have met our needs throughout this week. And from that abundance, sometimes, sometimes a real challenge for folks, we bring back and lay these gifts before you, asking that you use these gifts for your kingdom here and around the world. Um, bless each giver uh, and receive these gifts from the bottom of our heart. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. You notice that the baptismal, you may not have noticed, but the baptismal font is, is, uh, is here because in the early service, we celebrated the baptism of Josh Scott Jones. Jack and Sandy Jones, the third child, was baptized this morning, and it was really a very, very precious gathering at the 830 service. And, uh, and for any of, uh, any of the children that, that might be tuning in or, or hanging out with us in any shape or form, I just want to remind you that water is always a, a symbol of cleansing. Water is a symbol of cleansing, and, and we've talked a lot about, about the Jordan River last week. And remember that Jesus went down to the Jordan River himself to be baptized. And baptism is always a symbol that, that our sins have been washed away, not by anything we do, not by what the pastor does, not by what the family does, but what Jesus Christ has done for us when he died for us. So when you see water used in the church, uh, it's always reminding us of our baptism and what Jesus did for us. And so the symbolism, you know how when you go underwater, you can't breathe, um, at least you shouldn't without uh, some apparatus, okay? Um, I, that's my advice here since I'm talking with children here. But uh, you, you can't really breathe. And the symbolism is that our old life dies away and our sin dies away. And we come up out of the water. That's why when I see symbols of Jesus coming out of baptism, uh, it's just pure acting. But I, I like the symbol when Jesus comes out and the, and the one particular film when he comes out. Uh, you know, just representing the fact that a victory that takes place because our sins are washed away. So uh, again, I just, uh, we don't get to share everything with both services, but, but I wanted to remind you that, that uh, we had, uh, had a very precious uh, gathering with the Jones family all being with us this morning. Well, I want to encourage you to turn your hymnal to uh, a song that we don't do very often, but I absolutely love. It's number 380 if you have a hymn book. Most of you do not. But 380, there's within my heart a melody. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 5.
Jackie, could we ask you to lead us in prayer at this time? You need to know that I did not get to Jackie today, so she is just out of her good heart not embarrassing me here. That microphone is right here, Jackie. Right there. No, I think there's one right there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning we are honoring our veterans. And we are so proud of those that have served, those that are serving, and those who served in such a way that they're no longer with us. But Lord, they have fought the battle. They have fought for us to be so proud of being United States citizens and to be a part of this wonderful creation you made. And Lord, in all these things, we thank you. We also think, Lord, about this past week. And we know for many of us, it doesn't matter what our vote was. It's still uncertain as to the outcome. And isn't that so much like life? That there are times when we just don't know what the outcome will be and what the consequences will be. But Lord, always remind us that you are in charge, that it doesn't matter about the outcome as long as we stand strong on our Christian principles. I know we feel your presence with us this morning. It is so wonderful to be able to gather, to be in fellowship, and to also turn over anything that we might have done this past week that would have been unkind or harmful. Lord, help us to remember that your name, as we just sung, is the sweetest name we could ever think of. You are here to forgive our sins, and we are so grateful we have a Savior who willingly went to the cross that our sins might be forgiven. And Lord, as we approach the Thanksgiving season, remind us that we are so blessed every day of our lives. We're blessed to be here in church. We're blessed to have the technology to be able to watch it on television or YouTube, listen on the radio. Oh Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. Help us this day to remember who you are, what role you play in our lives, and that we have a loving Savior. And knowing that, Lord, we come to you together and pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture this morning is taken from Paul's letter, first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. Paul was talking about the coming of the Lord. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we are still alive that are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. This is the word of God for the people of God. 
Amen. One of the things I think about whenever we get to Veterans Day is I've got some very precious veterans in my own family, obviously, and uh, and I really and I, I really celebrate them. One of them being my my father. I often tell you that that uh, Dad, his name was Alton Wrights, by the way, uh, A L T O N. Uh, that'll be on the test later on, so make sure you get that. But uh, Dad would. Uh, uh, I think I've, I've told you, Bill, he blamed everything on the Navy. Anything that he did bad, he said, well, I learned that in the Navy. So I, I don't know if you've ever used that excuse or not, buddy, but, but uh, he did. <laughs> he spoke that a lot. And, and uh, yeah, I'd ask him if he'd ever tasted beer. Well, he said, I tasted it in the Navy. You know. And, Have you ever played cards? Well, yeah. I, 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 they taught me that in the Navy. And uh, so on, on he would go. Uh, Margie could have taught him, too, but, but you understand how that goes. For him and that family, that was a no-no. And uh, I just, um, look at that. I, I did not ask for that picture, but that's, that's a picture that I love very dearly that we all in our family hold on to. Um, seeing him with the glasses reminds me of the one story. He said that he lost his glasses, I thought, overboard of the ship. So he spent about six, uh, six months until he was eight, maybe it was six weeks. It sounds better if I say six months. Spent about six weeks until he got somewhere where he could get his glasses replaced. But that's really not what I wanted to talk about today. I want to talk about the day Dad died. Sad story in many ways, but, but it's not. Uh, he had pancreatic cancer. He was younger than what I am right now. And uh, uh, pancreatic cancer had, had racked his body. Uh, and I had, uh, I l was working, I was in a congregation who were very gracious. And they wanted me to go anytime I needed to go in order to be with them. And uh, so I did just that. Now, remember the day he died very well. I got there before my mother did that morning. And, uh, and believe it or not, he spoke to me that morning. And, and he said to me, you know, he, he just opens up his eyes. I said, Dad, touched him on his shoulder. And he opened up his eyes. He said, oh, hello, son. And then he kind of turned away from me. I'm not sure what that meant. But uh, he, he just turned, a quarter of a turn, you know, on, on the bed where he was. And those were really his last words. Now, think about that. Uh, think of all the things that fathers have called their sons sometimes over the years. My last memory is, hello, son. Uh, and I think there is coming a day when we are joined together again in, in all of eternity. I believe that's very biblical, and I think we can make a pretty good case for that from the scripture. In fact, you and I count on that, do we not? Having said that, I always want to be remembering that, that when Dad planned his funeral out, a song that he wanted to, uh, to do was called uh, Back of the Clouds. Of course, that chorus says Back of the Clouds. The sun is always shining. I don't know if, you ever, if you've ever heard that song, uh, but, uh, but it's one that I have in some of my books, and Dad liked it. It was in the, you know, in, in the churches there was a, when I was growing up, that was the last century, by the way, uh, when I was growing up, there would be a hymnal in the pew and a paperback book that was all the songs that we really liked to sing, you know? And uh, they're more gospel songs. They, uh, they, they weren't the lofty hymns, but they were, um, there, there was a lot more feeling and, and talking about love that was in those kind of hymns or those kind of gospel songs. And this song was one that he liked. And so I remember that he had put it down and he wanted that to be sung at his funeral. And so I remember sitting with my brothers and sisters and we sang the song with tears coming down. And, uh, and I've got the words for you. And I, and I tried to figure out what it was that dad liked the most about it. But it goes like this. Never fear the shadows dark around your path may fall. Do not let your heart be troubled. From his throne in heaven, God is watching over all. He will ever care for you. Back of the clouds, the sun is always shining. After the storms, your skies will all be blue. God has prepared a rosy tinted lining. Back of the clouds, it's waiting to shine through. Well, you can imagine, uh, maybe you can't imagine, but, but when you get a chance to study with these lofty church musicians, uh, these kind of songs just kill them. You know? <laughs> they, they don't talk enough about God. They talk a little bit more about our feelings. But that's one of the reasons some of these songs go. And maybe it's the tune. But Dad liked this song. And, uh, and all I could do was always picture, um, picture the clouds, so to speak. And I've got an image here of what I think he was thinking. Uh, 
when he thought of clouds, he thought of the fact that, that they brought storms, they bring rain, they ruin recreation, they make things grow. But I think what we'd really like is that, is that it would rain at night for two or three hours and then come out sunshine and dry it all up so we could have a very good day. Uh, doesn't that sound about right? If, you know, if I were planning the world, I would have considered that. And that's why God did not let me. I know that's exactly why. I think Dad, uh, he'd, he'd flown enough, you know, you know what it's like when you take off and there's clouds type of thing, but when you get above the clouds, the sun is shining, and you, you see this white fluffy, but underneath it you see dark and you can see lightning and uh, just, we see clouds as something kind of negative, something to be dissipated, and the sunshine is what really comes from God. Of course, we hear Jesus saying that the rain cause, God causes the rain to fall on the just as well as the unjust, and the sun on the just as well as the unjust. And it could well be, and most likely was, that, that in a land that's very dry, the rain was what the positive symbol was, and the sun was the one that parched everything. So there's this, this uh, cultural thing that happens in every generation about how we see clouds. We sing stormy weather, right? We, uh, we talk about dark clouds, things that are, are fairly discouraging. We do that all the time. And yet that's not the vision of clouds that we see in the scriptures. And uh, I suspect that the dad was thinking of something like this, and, and that's okay. I mean, that is a beautiful thing. When I, whenever I see the sun coming through, it does fill me with hope, and, and, I, and I get that. And I think in our culture, that's, that's a very common thing to do. But we who are familiar with the scriptures, old and new, I think we need to remember that the scriptures deal with the clouds more in the issue of, of the presence of God. And if you could just humor me a little bit here while I lay this out, uh, to understand that in the cloud, when, when God is talking about the cloud or when we see the cloud in the scripture, more often than not, it is where the presence of God is. Now, wouldn't that be cool if I could start looking at clouds that way instead of fretting about the fact that rain's going to happen and I might not be able to ride my bicycle, you know, or rain's happening. I'm not going to be able to cut the grass. You know, get what I'm saying? I want to start looking at clouds as if God himself is present in those clouds. So that's uh, the reason that, that Paul is writing to the Thessalonians. And don't forget, he's writing somewhere between 20 and 30 years after the resurrection. Uh, and, uh, but the Thessalonians, or the people of Thessalonica, were upset. Uh, they were struggling with the fact that they were waiting. You know, they, you know, they kept, they knew that the promise was for Jesus when he, in Acts 1, when we read, that when he's taken up into heaven, the angel said, why are you standing there? You know, he will return the same way he's come. He was taken up into the clouds, right? And so he will return the same way. And if you were anticipating the return of Jesus and immediately in your lifetime, and you begin to see the ones you know and love beginning to slip away into eternity, uh, and there was the doubting that started taking place as to whether or not those who had died before them would ever have the opportunity to be part of the kingdom of God. And, um, and that's why Paul is, is writing to them and trying to encourage them. Now, what we have to watch here, and we're going to take a look at these words once again, what we have to watch here is this passage is often used to be the, the number one thing that, that talks about the rapture. When Christ returned, um, you know, we, we sing the song Larry Norman used to sing, uh, two men walking up a hill, one disappears, one's left standing still, man and wife asleep in bed, uh, turns her head, uh, gone. Uh, the whole Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye, uh, we, we really became in the last century very, very infatuated with, with this doctrine of the rapture. And of course, I just, I want to remind you, I can honestly say, I can honestly say I'm not exactly sure how God is going to do it, but I don't believe that we can use this passage to make our whole theology many times, our whole understanding of who God is. And let me just share why. I believe that, uh, well, first of all, that whole concept uh, that became so popular in the 1900s of the rapture really has only been around for a couple hundred years. So that means all of the saints who had studied God's word up until that, until about 200 years ago, uh, did not really emphasize that, that particular thing. And since that time we have, and particularly in the last 100 years, we've emphasized it greatly. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but I'm suggesting that I believe there was another reason why, why Paul was talking to them. I don't think that Paul was giving us a blow by blow thing of exactly how everything will happen. I think what he was trying to teach uh, the Thessalonians is 
not to worry. Just like Jesus will come and be with you who are still living, he is already with the ones who have died. And, and when he comes back again, that type of thing, when he talks about the dead in Christ kind of rising first, uh, simply means they are included in what's getting ready to happen and, and in his kingdom. So there's, you know, when you, start to, when you start teaching about heaven, there's an awful lot of personal opinion about heaven. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, whatever vision people have had is, is all part of it. That doesn't mean they're wrong. And I may find, an, I'll get an eye opening someday. This I know. When I'm done on the face of this earth, I believe I will be in the presence of God Almighty because of Christ. I just want you to know that. I know that that sounds like old stuff and you've heard it again and again, but I'm absolutely convinced of that. And, and I think Paul is dealing with that here. Let me, uh, let me read verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Now be careful because I've known, I've known people who read this and say, ah, you, you know, Jesus, why are you grieving? Why are you upset? We know that they're in a better place. They have a new body. They're, they're in the presence of God. And they almost deny sometimes the grief that's so real and that needs to take place. And that's a mistake really is. Paul is not saying don't grieve. He's saying don't grieve like the people who have no hope. You understand the difference on that? The people who have no hope don't have the promise of God that, 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 that Jesus is coming again. They don't have the promise that, um, that, that we spend eternity with him, that we have the opportunity to, to be faithful to him all through the ever after life. Okay? And so the difference is when, when those of us believers grieve, it's intense. I've, I've been funerals, funerals and memorial services where we just weep and weep and weep. It isn't from unbelief. Uh, it is the fact that, that we have never experienced life without the ones we love. And it is a powerful, powerful emotion. But we always proclaim the hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus. You won't come out of a, a Christian funeral or a Christian memorial service or something like that without proclaiming, without proclaiming that Christ is Lord. And, um, and so what's different about those of us is we don't have to have <clears throat> everything going smoothly in our lives to have faith in God. Have you run into people who, because things have gone poorly for them, how could there be a God? You run into that? Um, that's what's different about those of us who know Christ. We, we don't have to have everything going. The joy of the Lord that we talk about isn't just of circumstances. Um, I've heard your Sunday school teachers, all our Sunday school teachers teaching this. The joy of the Lord is not conditional on how, how, how we are feeling at the moment. Our joy is complete because God who made us keeps his promises. And the one who created us, the one who saw us rebel against and provided that Christ would pay that price for you and for me. And because that price has been paid, we put our hope in the fact that we belong to him forever. We could die a martyr's death. We don't think like that here in the United States, do we? But plenty of our brothers and sisters around the world do. Uh, they know what it's like to to be martyred or to lay down their life um, or to put themselves secondary to what's going on. And so their joy, when they express joy, it isn't because their circumstances are so wonderful at that point. Let me read on. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. So you can see why, why doctrine is, is many times taught that, that, that it's got to be in, in a certain order. So Jesus is coming, but he stops in the air in a cloud then the dead in Christ rise at that point in time. So there's big discussions in theological circles many times whether or not the, is the soul in the ground or is it just the body? Or is the soul already resurrected? You, you understand? None of that, I don't think that's really being taught in this passage. There is one purpose that he had was that they would encourage one another and, and put their hope in the fact that, that Christ would care for the ones who, who, have gone, uh, who have gone on in death before them as well as the ones who are alive. And the good news is that if God is caring for us in the present, then he's caring for my dad in the past. 
And if he's caring for dad now, he's caring for me now and will care for me uh, if, uh, if I'm gone from this earth. I hate to even talk like that, but uh, it's true, right? I mean, it can, those kind of things happen. And uh, if that were the case, we'd look like the church we were 30 years ago. We're not. None of us are. So I'm just grateful for, for that privilege. I thought maybe I'd just review, and I won't keep you long here, but if I just review a little bit about, about how clouds are seen in the scripture. First one I pick up, and one of the times which I remember so clearly, is when Moses is leading the Israelites out of Egypt. Remember that? Uh, he's, Pharaoh's army is pursuing them. They've come up to the Red Sea and they are trapped. Powerful army on earth behind the Red Sea. It might as well have been, been the ocean, all the oceans put together for as far as they were concerned. There was nothing they could do. And what God did was during those two or three days there in which that happened, he came down in a pillar of fire and a pillar of a cloud, the cloud and fire. And, and we get this image of God existing in this cloud. And you know what I think is pretty cool about this cloud or whatever that was? I don't have to understand all this to be excited about it, all right? What was pretty cool, though, is that on the Israelite side of it, there was light. And on the Egyptian side, there was darkness. Isn't that amazing? Um, when the presence of God is, is in our midst many times, some see only the darkness and some see the light. Uh, the ho reason we have the hope is we begin to see the positive part of the presence of God. Presence of God can be awesome. It can be fearsome in some ways. It's never to be treated flippantly, but it is a marvelous thing, the presence of God. So you begin to understand that when you see clouds in the Old Testament, it talks about God's presence being there. How about Moses when he went up onto the mountain? He goes up onto the mountain and, and, uh, and, and God says, I'm going, to, I'm going to come down in the cloud so that though the people will not see me, they will be able to hear me speak to you. Ah, the presence of God in a cloud. And the cloud really kind of shrouds things in mystery. No matter, you know, I'm going to learn the rest of my life from things in the scripture, but I can't, there's some things about God I just can't know. Uh, that are still a mystery on that. But I enjoy the fact that I know God's present in this place. If any of you can physically see God right now, uh, let me know. I'd like to rub shoulders with you, to be honest with you. But, but in this cloud type of imagery, we realize that his presence in, in this place. Um, so I move on from that. This is a couple, here's the Psalms. Let me read to you. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So clouds. Uh, Ezekiel, then the glory of the Lord rose up. The house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the glory of the Lord. Nam, the Lord is slow to anger, but great in power and the clouds are the dust of his feet. When Jesus went up onto the Mount of Transfiguration, um, uh, they, you know, they could not, uh, you know, Moses and Elijah appeared there and they, there was, you know, they came in, in kind of a cloud. There's this mystery of God's presence in, in that particular account. Um, it, it, you know, it goes, it goes on one thing after, one thing after another. The ascension of Jesus, he goes up into a cloud, right? Um, so Paul is telling his readers that when they meet Christ, they will meet him in the clouds. And those who have gone before you and me, they will be meeting us in the clouds. We will meet in the presence of God. We'll, we'll be like Moses who was actually there with God uh, on the mountain. And we begin to get the presence. I don't think that the cloud is supposed to be descriptive of the way God looks and the way all of our moods need to be. I believe the cloud is this great mystery of who God is that's beyond any of us, but we get to enjoy being in his presence when that day finally comes. Now, let me tell you something. You're allowed to disagree with me. If, if, if you feel like I haven't treated the rapture the right way, I understand that. I just want to suggest to you that I don't think that's what this passage is always about. And if it is, I'll be glad. And I invite God to show me these things whenever, whenever he can, where he will. But you need to know that some of the greatest scholars that have lived, those who loved God, loved through Christ, have come down on different sides of this. So that we've got to be careful about proclaiming the things that we may not know about, but, but that God has still allowed to be uh, in the form of a mystery. But when you get to the last verse 
um, and I've got it for you right here. Here's what Paul says. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I wouldn't fight with people about the doctrines of heaven. I wouldn't discourage them. If someone is all about uh, the gold, gold streets, I wouldn't discourage them on that. I believe, I believe the, 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 that it's the most magnificent sight in the world. Uh, if some say, well, it's a new heaven and a new earth, uh, when we meet Jesus in, in the air, then, then we come back and we live in the new earth. I, th there's lots going on out there. Uh, my daughter Whitney said to me, everyone's been te telling me what they, they know about heaven. She says, I'm not sure I see it all. So she said, that, they said, we'll all have work to do when we get to heaven. I said, well, you know where that comes from. That, that comes from the book of Genesis when they were in the Garden of Eden uh, and they had responsibility. So it was thought quite clearly that, that they had responsibility so that when we're in heaven, we'll have responsibility. Others will say, I don't want to be there because I don't like playing the harp and I don't like singing. <laughs> the presence of God this mystery that he somehow lets us into him to know him, not, for, not just for his glory. The more we know about him, the more we will praise about him, the more we experience him, the more we will, will celebrate. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. As God has caring for you right now, he has already cared for those of you who love that have already gone into, uh, gone into his presence. All of God's people said, amen. amen. So I'm going to feel really bad if what I'm teaching and preaching today upsets you because that's not my goal. My goal is just to remind you how awesome God's presence is. And when you see a cloud the next time, I don't think I'm going to think rain is, but I'm going to think your presence is awesome, Lord. And I know that darkness and light could come out of your presence. Let's bow for prayer. I'm grateful to you, Lord, that you give us these basic scriptures that are key to our faith and core. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you've given a variety sometimes of, of, of students of the Bible who sometimes come down to a little bit different look in each of these things. But I know the people in this congregation, Lord, they love your word. And we want to walk in obedience to what we know. Help us to not add to the things you've already spoken. And help us to not take away to the things that you've spoken through your word. But that we use these words, all teaching from scriptures as, as, um, as we read in Timothy, uh, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for the instruction. Help us to comfort one another, Lord, when some of our friends go on to be with you and when some continue to live and do not understand why they're living. May we be as people, Lord, who hope in you. In Christ's name, amen. Well, I think this would be a very good time to sing Blessed Assurance. I invite you to stand.
We look forward to joining our Lord and Savior in the clouds someday. The presence of God. Until then, we walk in his presence on the face of the earth. Go, walk, read the scripture, seek him out, love each other, and go in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great day, folks.